title of this message is Infusing New Life into the Old Spouse. Infusing New Life into the Old Spouse. Mary Elizabeth Wilson of the United Kingdom married and buried four husbands in the span of three years. Now, at one of her weddings, one of her friends asked her at the reception, what shall we do with the leftover sandwiches and cake? And her reply, let's save it for the funeral. So she was eventually charged and convicted, uh, and convicted of murdering her husbands by poisoning them. Now, in her defense, this is what she had to say. She said that she loved every one of them. Scott Peterson of California, he was convicted of killing his wife. He was a serial adulterer, and he had a girlfriend at the time of the murder. And in prison, so handsome was he that he received so many fan mails and marriage proposals. So he was a ladies' man, he was a handsome man, he was in love with many women, just not his wife. Now, while many marriages do not end in murder, there are plenty of other things that happen. There are unfulfilled expectations, there's anger, resentment, there are cold wars, there are quarrels, you know, there are separate bedrooms, and there's also such a thing as unjust divorce. So marriage is really the single most difficult relationship. And while God does allow for divorces in certain cases and because of the hardness of man's heart, how can we overcome marital troubles in other cases? And the Word of God has been telling us over and over again, we put off the old man, we put on the new man. And this is Paul's practical advice and his focus from verse 18 onwards. You know, here he talks about the new wife and the new husband in verses 18 and 19. He talks about the new child and the new parent in verses 20 to 21. And he even talks about the new employee as well as the new boss or master in uh, the end of chapter 3 onto verse 1 of chapter 4. And so we see here that Christianity is a doctrine as well as a life. You see, faith and doctrine alone are dead without the life. And real spirituality is seen first and foremost in our dealings with others. Now, isn't it a shame that in many Bible-believing churches, even Reformed churches, we're not talking about controversy of, you know, uh, bizarre doctrines, but that we would argue and split over the most minor ones, and in the process of so doing, the way we relate to one another is worse than how unbelievers relate to one another. And so, where we actually see the proof of our Christianity, the most obvious place uh, where we can see our connection with Christ is our immediate social circle, and that is, of course, the family. The family, the home, and then the workplace, because this is where we spend the most amount of our time. And here in church, you know, we only really see the facade. Once a week, maybe twice a week, we see the better side, and already there are problems between us. But if a Christian puts off and puts on being ruled by love and peace as we have seen, being filled with scripture, speaking and doing all things to the glory of Christ, then the Christian must have an impact at home. And here, Paul speaks about the husband and wife. It starts with the husband and wife. Christianity will infuse new life into the old spouse. All right, we kind of don't like that phrase, old spouse, you know, my old spouse. But spiritually, that is what we are unless we are changed, infusing new life into us. So what happens when we infuse this new life into the old spouse? Well, firstly, the undutiful usurper changes into a deferential helper. The undutiful usurper changes into a deferential helper. 
Let me stretch that out a bit so we hear the full impact of that. The undutiful usurper changes into a deferential helper. And secondly, the bitter narcissist changes into a loving care, the bitter narcissist. So firstly, the undutiful usurper changes into a deferential helper. In verse 18, uh, Paul here tells the wife to put off sin, to be infused with the new life, to live that life in Christ. And he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, we might be wondering, why does Paul address the wife first? Is it because she's more difficult? Is it because, you know, he has to address the one who causes the problems first? I mean, obvious, isn't it? It's because he's chauvinistic and misogynistic. He, after all, uses the word submit. He really wants to give it to the wives, right? Well, no. To be clear, if you look at these comparisons that Paul has, wife, then husband, child, then father, servant, then master, we see that the second person in each of these groups of relationships biblically and historically, had the greater social responsibility to care for the first. So the husband cares for the wife, the parent cares for the child, the boss cares for the welfare of the employee. So when he speaks to wives first, it's because he had the graver and heavier words to give to the husbands. So wives, here, while Paul speaks plainly to you, and so will I, about how we should put on the new, know that what Paul requires is heavier on the husband. Now, we believe as a church that the Bible teaches complementarianism, a long word. Basically, what this means is that we believe that God created man and woman equal, in every sense, in every way, in value, in ability, in honor, just as Christ is equal to God in every way. But men and women are different in their roles, just as Christ is different in role and function to God the Father. You know, while Christ is equal to God, he submits himself to God, and so the wife who is equal in every way to the husband, she nevertheless submits to her husband. But because of the lies of the devil and because of sin, our perception as well as our experience uh, is far less than ideal, both for husbands and wives. And here we see why it's far less than ideal. It's because of our fallen state. You know, the wife, the old spouse, the natural sinful wife in her fallen state, she is an undutiful usurper, all right? She desires to usurp, to take away that authority, so to speak, from the husband. Now, it sounds terrible, but sin is that way. And the Bible describes the natural desire of the old, sinful, unregenerate wife her desire is to rule over her husband. Now, how do we know this? We know this from two sources. We know this, firstly, by deduction. In verse 18 of Colossians 3, you know, Paul's command to the wife is to submit to her own husband because it is fit in the Lord. It is dutiful. It is good in the sight of the Lord. And so if submission is the uh, action of the regenerate wife, then submission is not the action of the unregenerate wife, of the woman who is in her natural sinful state. And if submission is fit, if it is dutiful before God, then the old sinful behavior, which is a lack of submission, that is not dutiful, that is not fit in the Lord. So we see this by deduction. But we also know it by explanation. You know, we see that the natural sinful behavior of the woman is to rule 
over the husband. Uh, the desire is to usurp the husband. Now, in Ephesians 5, as we read, Paul quoted Genesis about a man leaving a woman, cleaving together with his wife, and being one flesh. So if you were to put your mind and let your mind return there, we learn that Adam was firstly created by God. Eve was created to be his suitable helper. Now, she was created from his side, from his ribs, so she is equal to him. But as 1 Corinthians 11.3 it tells us that the head of the woman is the husband. So there is an order. And we also furthermore learn from Genesis that God created Eve to be Adam's helper. So there's this order. And her godly role, Eve in the garden, her godly impulse was to submit to her husband, was to help him. But the fall changed all of that. When Eve was in the garden with Adam, she listened to the lies of the devil. She took the fruit and she ate it and she gave it to her husband who was next to her. And this gives us the impression, you know, not conclusively, but certainly the impression that while Satan was speaking to Eve, Adam was next to her. Not conclusive, but it certainly gives that impression. And so Eve did not follow God. She did not follow her husband, but she ate the fruit and she also gave the fruit to Adam, and he took it, and his sin plunged all of humanity into sin. And therefore, after that, her godly impulse to submit and to help, this was no longer there. Rather, it was replaced by a desire to rule. Now listen to the consequence of this sin uh, upon the woman. In Genesis 3, verse 16, God told Eve, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So there's the physical aspect of you know, birth, the emotional aspect of raising up children, that it will be hard. And he also said, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, the word here for desire uh, does not refer to a loving desire. He didn't say to Eve, you know, your, des your loving desire will be towards your husband. That's not the meaning there. But it was a desire to dominate and a desire to destroy. This same word desire is used when Cain was very angry with Abel. You remember that? Abel offered the better sacrifice, and Cain was very angry, and God came to to, to, to Cain, and he warned Cain. He said, sin is at your doorstep. It's about to come into your life. You, unto you, shall be his desire. Sin desires to get you. Sin desires to make you sin. He desires to rule and govern you, but you must rule over him. In other words, God was telling Cain that if Cain was not careful, sin would govern him. And we know that that's what happened. Cain was not careful. He allowed that anger, that sin to enter into him. And out of jealousy, he killed Abel. And this is the comparison that we see here. The unregenerate wife, her desire is to dominate. Her desire is to control her husband. But even in God's word to Eve, while her desire was to dominate and rule over her husband, his was, the curse on him was to rule over her. So part of the curse, part of sin is that there will be tension at home. There will be struggle. Hers will be to dominate. His will be to dominate back. You know, uh, we, we see it in Cain. Sin's desires was to control him, and he had to struggle to get mastery over sin. And this fallen nature, we see it all over Scripture. In fact, you see more examples of uh, marital problems than you see examples of marital successes in the Bible. Now, what are some examples of this? Sarah, she schemed to produce an heir. She gave Hagar to Abraham. That was her role, and it created problems. 
Ahab, King Ahab was evil, but he was made more evil by his wife Jezebel. You know, 1 Kings 21, it describes how Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. She was kind of riding him like a horse, and she had these spurs on her, her, her boots, and she was digging it into his sides so that he would be egged on more and more to do evil. You remember when he was grieving and he said, Ah, oh, Naboth will not give me his vineyard. You know, what did Jezebel say to him? You sure you're a man, nah? Just go and take it, nah? You're really a man, nah? Go and get it. Similarly, you have the woman called Zeresh. She was Haman's wife. She was not a help, but she stoked his anger, stoked his covetousness. You know, when, hate, when, when Mordecai sinned, or when Mordecai, in the eyes of Haman, sinned against him by not bowing to him, he was so angry, it was Zeresh, Haman's wife, who said, why didn't you build a gallows to execute Mordecai? And of course, we all know the famous account of Job's wife when he was suffering, and then she said, why are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, in the first three accounts, we know that the husbands were ruled by their wives, and it ended in disaster for them. You know, Abraham now had two women in his, in his life, and that eventually led him to lose one of his sons. Uh, Ahab was eventually killed. Jezebel, uh, she was eventually chased down by Jehu. She was thrown out of the tower. You know, the Bible tells us that her body bounced off the tower several times. You know, the horses trampled on her body. They ate the dogs, ate her flesh, and defecated her all over Naboth's vineyard. You see, such a terrible, terrible end. And in the end, Haman himself was executed, and months later, his 10 sons were also executed. All because of that unruly, usurping desire of these unregenerate wives. Now, wives, can you understand these women? You probably can, can't you? A wife may have the temptation to feel contempt for her husband. Why? Because at times we are contemptible. We are weak. We are foolish. We are inconsistent. We can make bad decisions. And wives may feel that they need to rescue the husband from these bad decisions. And because we do not give security and confidence, she feels as if she must take over out of anxiety to plan to make better decisions than his because his plans are not adequate. And what happens at home? This leads to conflict. What does he do in return? He dominates back. You know, and some wives have been so bruised by their husband's bitter dominance that they have been bullied into silence. Some may actually have been physically hurt and they should call the police. Or maybe they experience now no more overt domination. Husbands have, either out of bitterness or out of simple resignation, being passive aggressive, just let their wives do whatever their wives want. Let them decide whatever they want. Ah, oh, okay, law. Uh, tie it already. You, you do everything, uh, right? And this vicious, cyclical conflict goes on and on, and couples endure for so long. But the Bible tells us that this can stop. Wives the grief that you feel, it can end. How? By poisoning your husbands? <laughs> no, right? By putting off your sinful impulse, by putting on Christ's newness, the new spouse submits to the husband because she submits to God. Yes, he may be weak, inconsistent, foolish, but she submits to God. She puts off that desire to rule, puts on the desire to submit. She helps him fulfill his duty before God. And this idea of submission is all over the scripture. 
But I want to emphasize that this idea is not one of subservience to an authoritative, overbearing leadership. Now, there are some things to note here. This word, submission. Now, in the Greek, it was a military term. Uh, It means to arrange troops in a military fashion under the command of a leader. That's in the military sense. But in its non-military sense, which is the sense here, the non-military sense is a voluntary attitude of giving in, of cooperating, of assuming responsibility when delegated to carry a burden. So this means, therefore, that this word submit here has the same meaning as the word help. The wife becomes a deferential helper, taking the lead from her husband, helping him in all manners. And remember, we read in in verse 33 of Ephesians 5, the wife is to reverence. She is to respect her husband. And biblically speaking, I know some of you will say, uh, respect must be earned, correct? Well, biblically speaking, is respect is given. Respect is given. Now, many of the husbands, the reason why I say this is because many of the husbands, during the time of the early church, Paul was writing to the church, he didn't assume that every wife had a Christian husband and every Christian husband had a Christian wife, but there were many who were married to unbelievers because they were already married and then they converted. And so these pagan husbands would have been sinful and inconsistent and they would not have been the husbands required of by God in the scripture because they were unregenerate. And yet Paul tells these wives to respect, to submit themselves just as much as he tells Christians to submit themselves to the authorities, even these pagan authorities, even these authorities who would persecute Christians, respect and submit to them. So this is the response of a renewed wife, and we learn here that it is beneficial to her. It is beneficial. Because submission is intimate. We see here, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, very clearly now, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible does not speak about women submitting to men. Hmm? Silent cheer here for all the women, right? It says here, wives submit to your own husbands. It shows intimacy. This is the husband that she owns. She owns his body. And as much as he also possesses her, she possesses him. They are one flesh. We're not patriarchal. We don't believe that, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what Chinese got the, there are two words for marriage, right? One is you marry into, and one is you are married. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? So, <laughs> We don't believe that one joins the husband's family. You know, we believe that they become a completely different family. They are one flesh. They belong to one another. And in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 to 4, Paul says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. This verse, though speaking about something else, gives us the impression and tells us clearly that who owns you, wives? Your husbands. The husbands, who owns you? Your wives. Ephesians 5 tells us they are one flesh. And so in verse 28, it tells us that when men love their wives as their own bodies, He loves himself, and vice versa, right? When a wife submits her own husband, it does her good. It is beneficial when she submits to him in love, to his spiritual oversight, to his decisions. When she helps him, it is beneficial. And we also see here that the submission is not absolute. 
The wife is not required to do everything that the husband says. The idea is not that the husband orders and the wife just follows. Again, we do not subscribe to patriarchy. Ephesians 5.21, as we read, it says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. As I said, husbands and wives are equal before Christ, just as Christ and God are equal. But her submission, as she gives it, cannot be to things contrary to the commandment of God. She's not obliged to do whatever the husband says. In fact, there are times when the wife cannot submit to her husband when her husband tells her to sin, because wives are to choose to obey God rather than men. And that is why in Colossians 3.18 it says, as it is fit in the Lord. It has to be fit and dutiful to God. And if the motivation is not the Lord, it will not last. It's the same thing for us, you know, in our pursuit of holiness. If we're only doing it because it's the right thing to do, rather than to be motivated by the love of Christ, then our obedience will never be complete. So here, the submission of the wife is unto the Lord. It is beautiful. It is fit in the sight of the Lord. And it also makes her beautiful in Christ. Because an undutiful usurper changes into a deferential helper. But secondly, the bitter narcissist changes into a loving carer. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, this sounds terrible. How can husbands be bitter against their wives? The fact that he has to tell them not to be bitter shows you that men and husbands are often selfish, narcissistic, they are resentful, so much so that Paul had to tell husbands to love their wives because the natural impulse of the husband is to resent the wife. And this happened in the beginning. You know, when Adam fell, God asked him, did you eat of the fruit? And what was Adam's response? You gave me the woman. She's the one who gave it to me. And I ate. So not only did Adam resent Eve through the things that he said, he also blamed God for the gift of this helper. And this resentment can take the form of bitterness. The word Uh, bitter can be translated as angry or indignant. So you can translate this, husbands love your wives, don't be angry with them, don't be irritated with them, fight irritation. Now according to the uh, Bible dictionary of the New Testament, it says that this word bitter regularly denotes the bitterness associated with disappointment, hate, and anger. Now, gentlemen, I don't have to go into too much of what you feel at times for your wife because I sinfully also feel this. The old nature, this is the effect of the curse. The old nature of the sinful wife is to usurp. And as we saw, the sinful nature of the husband is to struggle back and to fight against that. You know, the wife wants to dominate? She wants to dominate? Well, I am going to dominate back. I'm gonna fight. I will suppress, I will force her submission. And because Paul used this word bitter, it implies that in the husband's thinking, the wife has given him reason to be bitter. And how many of you gentlemen here, you know, will will think, She did this. It's her fault. I'm like this. All right? It's that sinful attitude to dominate. And he may be even so harsh in his attitude, but he would defend it. She deserves it. Or it could swing to the other way. He could also justify his uncaring attitude toward her. 
Huh? You want to do? Do. I'm going to go take a nap. You do. I'm just going to go out with my pals. I'm going to not do anything. I don't care anymore. This is the bitter attitude. And, you know, we, we, th- this attitude we see in places in the scripture as well. Adam was bitter against Eve. We also see this example in the case of a very famous pagan couple, Queen Vashti and King Ahasuerus, if you remember, right? King Ahasuerus was having his own little dinner party. Queen Vashti was having her own party. And then, you know, King Ahasuerus threw this party so that he could show people the wealth that he had to get support for a war that he wanted to fight. And so in his desire to show off, he wanted Queen Vashti to appear before him, before all the guests, in an inappropriate way, of course. He didn't love her. He wanted to use her. He wanted to dominate her. And when she did not come, when she refused to come, he went as far as to banish her. But this kind of attitude, this is what the renewed husband needs to put off. He needs to instead put on the selfless impulse to love and to care for her. Verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? If wives are to submit, wouldn't you expect Paul to have said, Husbands, rule over your wife? I mean, obviously, rule is opposite to submit, but Paul didn't do that. Instead of saying, Husbands, rule your wives, he said, Husbands, love your wives. Because ruling over your wives is actually an effect of the curse. Her desire shall be unto uh, her husband, and her husband shall rule over you. So this domination is not the opposite of submission. The counterpart is love. But many Christian husbands as well misread what the scriptures say. They say, if she has to submit, therefore I have to rule. Now, Howard Hendricks said, a lot of frustrated sergeants are running around with biblical clubs in their hands, shouting, I am the head of my house. And they're the only ones who are convinced. So often in the Christian home, love is absent. But the renewed husband loves the wife. Now, yes, Ephesians 5 does say, that the husband is the head of the wife, just as God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the church. But remember that God doesn't rule over Christ. You know, Christ does not dominate the church, but he loves the church and he leads it through his love. And so as the head, the husband's role is not to rule, but the husband's role is to love. And therefore, the exercise of his leadership must be loving, otherwise it's worth nothing. Now, granted, our text here does not deal with the specifics when it comes to gender roles. You know, uh, doesn't say the husband go and work, the wife stay at home, the, you know, this, that, the other. Doesn't say it. It doesn't talk about the division of responsibilities. That would be a different message, right? But suffice it to say, at this point, the husband has headship, leadership, the wife is to help. And in doing that as a head, what does Paul have to say? In Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, he tells the husband that he must love and care for the wife's need. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it. So he is to love his wife as his body. He is to nourish her. And this is not feeding your wife more, but it is to nourish her spiritually, to teach her. And this requires, therefore, husbands to study to grow, to be able to instruct, 
And this is not in doctrinal matters, mind you, alone. This is in moral issues. Now, what is the context of Colossians 3? What does it have to do with? It has to do with putting off the old, putting on the new. You know, if you are bitter, malicious, and angry, and wrathful, that you're to put away all of these things to be forbearing, and loving, and patient, and so forth. So how can an angry husband instruct his wife to be forgiving? How can a malicious husband lead his wife to be tender-hearted, patient, forbearing? So when he nourishes her, when he cherishes her, it is more in teaching, it is more than doctrinal instruction. It is moral instruction. And here in the context of Ephesians 5, the husband must be like Christ. Christ's aim for the church is the sanctification of the church, that he might present the church holy, that he might cleanse the church by the washing of the water of the word. So therefore, the husband's desire in his love for his wife is to see her grow in holiness. You know, brothers, if we are gossips, if we are liars, if we are angry, sharply worded people in our group chats, not giving the benefit of the doubt, giving ourselves over to the sins of sensuality, if we are not mature, how hard, therefore, would it be for our wives to submit to angry men like us? But if they can see your holiness, your kindness, your maturity in your conversation, in your guarded words, that you're not a bitter person, but you're a forgiving, patient, a mature person, this helps them to submit to your leading and to your instruction. I know I'm probably gonna get it from my family later for this example, but have we ever done to our kids yelling at them to be quiet? It's a bit ironic, isn't it? Be quiet! Irony, in the same way, how do we lead and help what First Peter tells us, the weaker vessels, the more tender vessels in their growth in Christ, if we ourselves may be big-headed doctrinally, but small-hearted morally, how do we lead them in that way? And brothers, I know, we don't always want to surrender and grow, do we? So how can we love our wives to lead them spiritually to be heads, for us to be heads if we're unwilling to deny self and die to our flesh? How do we cherish them? You know, Jesus loved the church so much that he died in the flesh. So love must be so sacrificial that we are willing to die to our sinful flesh. In Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So when we are mature, dying to self, putting off the old, listening to God, leading our wives to love Christ, to be holier, praying for her, she will grow spiritually. And when she grows spiritually, she grows in all of her various duties before God as well. And if we nourish her, we take care of her. What is that phrase? Happy wife, happy life. Happy and holy wife, happy and holy life. Imagine the opposite. You are an angry, bitter sergeant at home, unholy, not leading. What's, what will happen? Oh, you can bet your wife will definitely usurp. And you can bet that you will definitely dominate back. You can bet that, you, that she will fight you and you will fight her. And the conclusion is unhappy husband and wife, unhappy and unholy husband and wife, unhappy and unholy, strifeful life. So what are some applications? What are some applications? We've spoken about some. I'm sure couples here, 
have experienced much trouble in the home. You really want to know what I am like? <laughs> Speak to my wife and my kids. Don't say. You speak to my husband, uh, my husband, speak to my wife, speak to my kids, you will know what I am really, really like. In church, you see the good parts, don't you? And it's not that good anyway. But what are some applications for us? At home, there's unsubmissiveness, there's bitterness. Husbands and wives, if you return home today, and if husbands are to point out the unsubmissiveness of your wives, then you have missed the point. And if wives, you were to mock the frustration of your husbands, to point out their anger, you have also missed the point. And if you return home and you choose not to speak about it because such communication is so uncomfortable, then you have also missed the point. Wives, pray for your husbands that they will be holy heads of families. Submit yourselves to God. Resolve in your heart to respect your husband, to be a helper, not a usurper. Ask him for forgiveness if you have despised him, if you have tried to dominate. Husbands, pray for your wives. Grow in holiness. Put off your sins of fraternity. Stop being bitter against them. Resolve in your hearts to love and care for them, leading them in holiness. Ask them for forgiveness when you have tried to dominate them or when you have been passive aggressive apathetic in attitude again being bitter against them so what am i applying here what should we do talk communicate and i'm sure this will be reminded of me later too but who should initiate it Wives, if you said your husband should initiate this conversation, you're both right and you're both wrong. If he does not initiate it, what do you do? Help him to initiate it. And husbands, if you are waiting for your wives to initiate it, because that's what we commonly do, then we are wrong. Dear, let's talk later. Let's set things right. Let us forgive one another. You know, while your marriages may not have resulted in murder, there's probably a lot of deadness in it. And that is why we need to infuse new life into the old spouse. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom of his church, and all that he has ever done was to love his people, to lead them, and to desire that they grow in holiness and even effecting their holiness. And he is working in us daily that we as a church would submit ourselves to him. We pray that you help the families, Lord, the husbands and the wives, that their life should be renewed to a greater glory that you have intended. Please, Lord, we pray that your words would not fall upon deaf ears but that there will be mutual submission to talk, to communicate. Help husbands and wives to love you above all else and one another that they may accomplish this work.
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.